The subject is history, or more precisely, the history taught in the high school of the border town of Frontera, Texas, to students who reflect the town's mix of Anglo-Americans, Tejanos, that is, Texans of Mexican descent, and Mexicans, but also African Americans, described by one character as, quote, the smallest group except for a couple Kickapoo kids, end quote, and, as mentioned, a few Native Americans. A white mother says that Pilar, the history teacher and a Tejana native of Frontera, has, quote, got everything switched around, end quote, in the history she's teaching. Pilar replies that she's trying to get across, quote, some of the complexity of our situation, end quote, when a white teacher agrees that they are only, quote, presenting a more complete picture, the white parent bursts out, and that's what's got to stop. The moment is funny, but nicely ambiguous. Pilar is a central and sympathetic character in the film, so it's easy to read the encounter as a protest against giving a completely truthful and so necessarily complex picture. In other words, to see it as a refusal to hear the whole truth, or at least to hear certain truths. The outraged uh, white parent doesn't mind, she says, cultures coming together when it's about, as she puts it, music and food. But she is indignant, quote, when you start changing who did what to who, end quote. The confrontation began with the mother's complaint that, quote, you're just tearing everything down, tearing down our heritage, tearing down the memory of people that fought and died for this land, end quote. When a Chicano father interjects that his people also fought, but fought the U.S. Army and the Texas Rangers, an Anglo father replies that, quote, winners get the bragging rights, end quote. Another white parent calls the teaching propaganda, acknowledging that, quote, they got their own account of the Alamo on the other side, but we're not on the other side, so we're not about to have it taught in our schools, end quote. Now, perhaps the mother's original complaint is that what is being taught is false, as well as disrespectful. Other comments suggest other views, that winners have the right to tell the story their way, or that we are entitled to insist on the version of history that we prefer, or that communicates the heritage we value and wish to bequeath to our children, where we here assumes a self-identified and authoritative community. The discussion ends inconclusively, and one wonders if it could end any other way. Lone Star is about history, collective and intimately personal about mythologies and legends, revised or selected memories, and just plain secrets and lies. In Lone Star, the truth, or rather some truth, that transforms local and personal histories does come out, but only to a few. We don't know at the end of the movie which discoveries will be shared and which truths will be reinterred so that certain lives or legends can more easily go on. The viewpoint of the film is not a postmodern repudiation of truth as simply narratives all the way down. It begins with a piece of literally hard forensic evidence, the discovery of a metal badge in the desert. Eventually the sheriff discovers what a couple of townsmen always knew, facts about whose it was and how it got there, and there's a murder involved. But while there are facts that can refute certain stories, and with them some people's understanding of who they and other people are, there are also facts, including facts about what people did, that are compatible with varied interpretations and explanations. History is facts, but not only facts, and that is why it is also an argument, and not infrequently a struggle among individuals and within and between communities. I want to talk about historical accountability and about an attitude that might be described as a kind of civic virtue, a desirable disposition for a citizen to have, a willingness, if not a demand, for their society to be historically accountable. The title of my talk describes the arc of the lecture. I begin by explaining what I mean 
by historical accountability and make my way to why it matters and so why an openness or even stronger a commitment to it might be a valuable disposition for a citizen, in particular for a citizen of a democratic and pluralist society to have. Accountability is a familiar notion, but it's not a univocal one. Historical accountability is not a familiar notion, but it seems to me a notion we need in order to make sense of what is at stake in the kind of struggle over what history to tell, which includes but goes beyond the fact that some claims are true. I'm not going to give a complete account of the requirements of historical accountability, but I will argue that historical accountability matters because of its impact on our interpersonal, social, and political relationships. If societies refuse to be accountable for a truthful history, they fail in their obligations to their members. When citizens resist this same knowledge, they show a lack of civic virtue of a particular kind and fail in a commitment to their community's shared understanding. As important, they may undercut, even quite unintentionally, the respect they should show to fellow citizens. But this argument involves, as does the argument in the scene in Lone Star, not only facts about right, rights and wrongs, or who did what to who, but also presumptions of authority with respect to common shared belief. Or, as the angry mother puts it, quote, now you people can believe what you want, but when it comes to teaching our children, and the line and scene trails off. So first, accountability, what is that? Accountability is a relation, a form of relationship, in which A, one person, is accountable to B, in the matter of A's conduct, in particular, those aspects of A's conduct concerning which B has legitimate interests and expectations. One might say, in fact, that accountability is the relation at the core of morality as a living institution rather than a theory. Whatever the particular substance of our moral beliefs, beliefs about what's obligatory or forbidden or what is best and what is bad, the motor of moral relations, how we keep them going among us, is the insistence on and acceptance among individuals of mutual accountability under these standards for how we behave. So it's not the standards, but how we put the standards to use in holding each other to account. Accountability ranges more widely than morality. It connects individuals to others through the recognition of their responsibilities under shared norms, whether these are norms of law or morality, agreement or common understanding. In holding each other accountable, we invoke and so assert and reinforce norms that we assume are relevant and recognized between us. Within this form of relationship, we are entitled, in some contexts we're obliged, to demand an accounting of others when their conduct appears to transgress a shared norm. Just by requiring someone to answer for conduct, we call attention to the existence and authority of a norm that we presume applies to that conduct. Calls for accountability can be rejected or rebutted, but not just in any way. Practices of accountability are themselves constituted and regulated by norms, norms for when it's acceptable to call others to account and for appropriate responses to others' accountings or to their refusal. If one does not accept demand for accountability, though, there is something in the situation or the presumed relationship that one is bound to disown. One either denies the reality or interpretation of one, what one is asked to account for, or rejects the validity or application of the norm supposed, or denies that one is properly or fairly called to account in this instance, or denies that the one demanding an account is entitled to it. To respond to demands for accountability is to acknowledge a kind of relationship and its implications. To refuse demands for accountability or simply to ignore them 
is either to deny that kind of relationship or to posit another kind. Thus, the call and response of accountability relations presumes both shared norms and assumptions about relationships. Demands for accountability and replies to them, in turn, can both assert, reinforce, or reject norms, but also they can invite, confirm, or reject relationships. In this way, practices of accountability are dynamic. They can either presume norms or relations, or they can propose new ones. If people succeed in holding people newly accountable, then new norms or new relationships are being brought into play. Not all accountability, not all accountability relations are symmetrical, that is, ones where I'm accountable to you exactly in the way you're accountable to me, so employers are accountable to employees in different ways than employees are accountable to employers. That's an institutional case. But where we accept that we are moral equals, then we are all answerable to each other under at least the most fundamental moral requirements. Accountability in its most basic sense means a presumption that someone can be called to answer to stand before others for an examination of and judgment upon his or her behavior. Uh, I call this answerability. Answerability is an interpersonal standing, a way of being regarded by others. It's what the philosopher P.F. Strawson called being regarded with a participant attitude. If someone submits herself to the examination and judgment of her conduct, she makes herself actively accountable. So sometimes we call people accountable, we mean that they may actively uh, respond to requests that they answer. But if someone refuses to accept that she is rightly placed under other scrutiny and judgment, she may still be held to account. That is, others may undertake scrutiny and judgment despite her indifference or resistance. Beyond this basic meaning of being held accountable, that is, being called to answer, and to endure the judgments and attitudes that ensue, accountability can have the further meaning of being liable to penalty or punishment. In many contexts, when people speak of accountability, they mean exposure to punishment or penalty for wrongful conduct. Criminal prosecution and legally imposed punishment are for many people the paradigm of this kind of accountability. This is certainly a very consequential kind of accountability. You not only have to answer, but people can do something very bad to you <laughs> if, uh, if it goes a certain way. It's certainly very consequential, but it would be a mistake to think of it as the only kind. Not all accountability involves the fact that punishment is coming. It is surely not the kind of accountability that makes the gears of everyday moral relationships engage. Indeed, precisely what makes these recognizably moral relationships is that they are sustained by our reciprocal acceptance that we are answerable to each other in certain matters, whether or not anyone has the authority or the ability to impose penalties, other than maybe reproaches or altered attitudes. Now, answerability, accountability without the punishment part, might seem like a weak form of accountability, but consider what its absence or rejection means. To refuse to answer is either to reject shared norms or to deny a relationship. If wrongful harm has occurred and human agents are responsible, for those agents simply to refuse to answer is for them to hold themselves above or outside moral relationship to those they have wronged either denying the authority of basic moral requirements or denying that those wronged are entitled to hold them to account. This amounts either to a threat, I'm not bound by your rules, or an insult. Who are you to ask me to answer? More commonly, however, accountability demands are not just refused, but instead are dodged by excuse, evasion, or indifference without outright denial of norms or relationships. Dodging accountability 
might be identified more precisely as a lack of integrity, a concept to which I will return later. Now, if that's accountability, what's historical accountability? If accountability is a relation, in historical accountability, who is accountable to whom and for what? Now, I mean by historical accountability, an obligation of communities, societies, or nations to aim at a truthful version of events in their own history. In some cases, this might include an obligation to other communities, societies, or nations involved in that history, but it is always an obligation to the members of the community whose history it is. The history for which a society is accountable, in particular, is a history of grave wrongs and systemic injustice. Now, I'm drawing here on an idea that has emerged as an international norm in recent decades, that there is a right to the truth of victims and societies about gross violations of human rights and serious breaches of humanitarian law, and a corresponding obligation of states to investigate and make available the results to their victims, the relatives and representatives of victims, and to society as a whole. Let me explain this idea of a right to truth a little bit more. A 2006 study on the right to the truth by the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights sums up a consensus of international law, practice, and jurisprudence that there is a right to such truths about gross abuses, that it is both an individual and a collective right, and that it is an inalienable and autonomous right. In other words, it stands all on its own. Access to the truth is seen as a profound need of victims, victims' families or representatives, and their societies. Victims and families need to know the truth to avoid torment and to have their dignity and the wrongfulness of their suffering officially acknowledged. But the study also refers to United Nations principles to combat impunity, which affirm the right of a people or a society to know its, quote, history of oppression, that is, quote, part of its heritage, and affirms the corresponding duty of the state to, again I quote, preserve collective memory from extinction guarding against the development of revisionist and negationist arguments, end quote. The study concludes that the right to truth is, quote, closely linked to the rule of law and to the principles of transparency, accountability, and good governance in a democratic society, end quote. Now, my point here is not to appeal directly to an international norm but rather to get at the understanding out of which this norm has evolved. That there are both additional harms that befall victims of grave injustice when gross wrongs are not acknowledged, and that there are dangers and injustices inherent in societies that resist an honest accounting of their past. There are interpersonal, social, and political goods at stake in whether societies undertake to be or refuse to be historically accountable. i say something briefly about this. Interpersonally, individuals who suffer current injustice or are aware of continuing effects of past oppression in their communities, for example, a racial group with a history of serious, severe social injustice or exclusion, Individual members of that group face a double burden in living among others who do not share or understand this experience and who may deny it. Others may not only fail to recognize the individual disadvantages that injustice imposes and the need for reform or redress, but those who experience injustice are likely to encounter skepticism or denial of their own credibility, even of their own character, if they insist that their situation of injustice and its consequences are real. It's not only that their complaint might be discredited, but they might be. 
They are likely to be seen as losers or whiners, as people who do not love their country, or people who are looking for special advantages rather than justice. Socially, members of groups that have been stigmatized, mistreated, or persistently disadvantaged will find that there is a burden of proof on them to overcome widespread skepticism or suspicion that is, in a sense, not unreasonable in their fellow citizens. <coughs> if the most widely believed histories, the ones that are taught and assumed, are ones that are incompatible with or just silent about the actual historical experience of their group, their fellow citizens who do not share their history will find it difficult to believe what is in fact true. And politically, the very identities of many groups have been shaped by their roles in projects of nation building, official or popular narratives, and ideals of national identity that either enshrined or celebrated the experience of their group as central or important, or excluded, marginalized, or buried it. Groups with different histories will understand power, responsibility, government, and citizenship often differently from each other. Now, societies, I suggest, are under an obligation to aim at and propagate truthful histories that do not compound grave and systemic past injustices to some of their members with present burdens of amnesia or denial that demean or exclude them. When a society through its major educational and civic institutions shirks accountability to its citizens for an honest history, it either disavows the demands of justice itself or refuses a relationship of due respect and recognition toward its citizens. And in doing so, it contributes to relationships of unequal respect among citizens and relations of misrecognition or contempt on one side and resentment and alienation on the other. So that's the problem. But the work of truth and the play of falsehood in these matters is, in fact, very complex. For example, a 2009 report of the Consultative Group on the Past in Northern Ireland, this was commissioned by the government, an official, an official investigative body, gives this explanation of how a shared history can be a source of division and struggle. I quote, Divided communities carry different experiences and understandings of the past in their minds, and indeed it is this that divides them. Their accounts of the past differ deeply. They are used as a marker to determine and make positive, but more frequently negative, moral judgments on each other, and so continuing the legacy of suspicion, mistrust, and hatred." End quote. This is a good description of many cases, and presumably, according to the committee, of Northern Ireland. Yet it cannot simply be generalized. For one thing, the Irish conflict is one that exists for many in living memory with highly defined, clear political sides. Uh, for another, many events that are the source of heated disagreement in this situation are nonetheless widely known in society. People can differ on interpretation responsibility, but they're differing often over things that they all know happened. Many other situations, especially ones with intergenerational histories, include the complication that much of the actual history of peoples or communities is buried or is represented only in fragments of odd fact or involves um, pockets of memory that hold local histories that are not known outside of particular communities or only known in certain segments of those communities, or is encapsulated in the oral tradition of communities that are without public recognition and may be corrupted 
in their own ways, in part precisely because they are not tested by public scrutiny and debate. Much is simply unknown or known in incomplete and distorted ways, even by those communities most directly affected. But it's even more complicated than this. Many publics and societies that contain these submerged histories are likely, if they are not directly mobilized in seeking and contesting these histories, to know nothing or very little about the histories. And yet, at the same time, many people are very likely to have general and vague beliefs that are not neutral with respect to the histories they do not know. So in other words, there are, and one could give examples, there can be assumptions about, for example, how our country grew from sea to shining sea that doesn't include the idea of repetitive, uh, violent uh, cleansing of native people and deliberate um, projects of extermination of people and their culture. Well, to believe one of these things is to find it very hard to believe some of the others. So for many cases, it's unhelpful to speak of conflicting histories or even of denial, for these terms denote well-defined positions, A and not A. Instead, there are many varieties and modalities of unknowing and misknowing. There are silences where there is something, maybe something important to say. There is selective appropriation of facts to fit a pre-existing storyline. Or some events, narratives, or sources are made prominent, effacing or displacing others. This leads to history as a kind of fable, where a simpler and to some more acceptable story, sometimes a self-serving or even glorifying story, is constructed out of incomplete, altered, or edited truths as much as actual lies or falsehoods. The problem for societal truthfulness can be conflict or denial, A or not A, but it can be and often is silence, euphemism, selective attention, or fables where truth should be. I see historical accountability as a society's commitment to more complete, accurate, and representative histories. In particular, it is a commitment to histories that are required in actual context in order to make it reasonable for people to believe what is in fact historically true, where that truth matters for basic relations of recognition and respect among members of society. Now I hasten to add that there can be more than one truthful version of events so long as the factual truth of any one of the versions is compatible with the factual truths of the others. I do not mean to pretend that there are bare facts without interpretation, nor do I mean to deny that the significance of facts is dependent on some narrative which combines and interprets them, and which can make some apparently important facts turn out to be trivial, or apparently trivial facts turn out to be important. There's the facts, and then there's the interpretation you put on them. And I don't mean to say that it's always easy or obvious to know what is factually true. It can require a great deal of effort and even specialized techniques. Think of forensic science that uncovers what really happened at a massacre. People can't just figure that out by looking. I mean to suggest only that it's possible in particular contexts to agree that there are some truths for which there is significant evidence and even if these truths are compatible with more than one interpretation, they are not compatible with all interpretations. There are facts that constrain reasonable interpretations, at least for those who share some ordinary standards of evidence. Now there's a lot, there's a lot um, uh, buried in that phrase. Such facts are the shared starting points for what might, not without contest or debate, turn out to be a shared history or as likely a set of overlapping, if not identical, historical narratives. Historical accountability involves an openness then to investigations of unwelcome aspects of one society's record, instances where society's policies or actions have been unfair or worse, and may have persisting effects, 
People, of course, are glad to identify with the noble, heroic deeds and contributions of their societies. Candid histories that take up episodes in a nation's or community's history that are unflattering or shameful, on the other hand, threaten beliefs of some members about their society. Manifestly corrupt and violent regimes have typically relied extensively on lies, fabrications, disinformation, and euphemisms. But societies that pride themselves on their adherence to the rule of law and democratic values also engage in self-flattering and self-justifying narratives, partial truths, or strategic silences. Maintaining deniability, despite grave wrongs, usually requires that a large part of the public chooses not to know about those wrongs, or not to know more about them, or not to know certain details about them, or even perhaps not to know that some of them are still going on. Walls of denial and deniability are a typical feature of social arrangements that are violating some basic standards of justice or decency. They shield act institutions from the view of citizens, but also allow citizens to shield themselves from confronting what is going on or from understanding it in ways that would be disturbing. So they shield institutions from accountability to citizens, citizens from accountability to each other, and everybody from accountability to their truthful history. Denial and deniability cuts off a society from its own present and its history, but it also cuts off members of society from each other, isolating direct victims of violence or their descendants, making their claims of violence or injustice and its consequences easy to disbelieve, Truthful accountings inevitably confront or attack these saving fictions, but while the exposure of particular facts can sometimes begin a cascade of revelations, when it comes to national mythologies and deeply seated attitudes bound up with the identities of citizens, it will take nothing less than a wholesale shift in the social presumption of truthfulness and burdens of proof to allow the truth to be established. This means that truth discovery and recovery concerning unsavory parts of history will require not just a new look at facts, although it does require that, but also a reconsideration of how citizens see themselves, their national and personal identities, and their civic and personal loyalties. And so it will typically, perhaps naturally, provoke defensive anger dismay, fear, and disorientation, often in very combative forms. The mirror held up to a society in these cases forces revision in mutually supporting beliefs about who we individually and collectively are, what is good about how we live, and for what and to whom we are responsible. And so there is much to tempt us to avoid or resist confronting uncomfortable truths about the past and to make us angry at those who would thrust these truths upon us. Virtues, it has been said, provide valuable correctives to human tendencies that, however natural, are not conducive to good lives, both individually and in community. In the face of predictable resistance to historical accountability, there is a role for the virtue I will call civic integrity. So now we're to the civic integrity part. In accountability relations, we keep each other and allow ourselves to be kept responsive to moral demands and to each other as rightful judges of our conduct. Integrity is the virtue of accountability relations. Integrity is the firm habit in thought, feeling, and action of being appropriately responsible, I'm sorry, appropriately responsive to demands for accountability. This means being willing to give accountings of oneself where they are properly called for, to accept the implications of the judgments and attitudes that properly ensue, and where accountability demands are out of place, where they are involve invasions of privacy, 
or illegitimate assumptions of authority or false presumptions of relationship to refuse them. It takes integrity to say it's not your business when it's really not your business. To lack integrity is to fail to be reliably responsive to legitimate demands for accountability. Of course, those who refuse or are indifferent to moral accountability to other human beings in a wholesale way and who, are routinely, uh, and who routinely treat other human beings purely instrumentally or with casual contempt or violence are not merely people whose integrity are in question. Either they are psychopaths or they are in so some other way um, vicious. But I want to talk about the significance of the virtue of civic integrity for those for whom the cultivation of this virtue is a real possibility. Civic integrity is the integrity appropriate to individuals in their role as citizens, and I have in mind citizens of a liberal democratic society that is committed in principle, whatever its failings in fact, to the individual dignity, freedom, and equality of its citizens. Civic integrity is no doubt broader than the aspect of it that I am trying to capture in my discussion of historical accountability. I would describe civic integrity in general as the firm disposition of citizens in thought, feeling, and action to approve and insist upon their society's honesty and truthfulness and to disapprove actively of hypocritical, dishonest, evasive, or corrupt activities in their society. And I could give a list of uh, things that also I think would be um, the sorts of things that uh, civic integrity um, ca uh, causes one to stand against or disapprove of, such as um, uh, covert agendas that can't be avowed because they can't be publicly defended, um, uh, rationalizing official practices which violate the society's own avowed values, um, shirking historical obligations when they are inconvenient, or um, endemic or systemic corruption. So I can give a long list of ways in which that virtue would not stand for those things or would stand against those things. But the aspect of civic integrity I am thinking of here is a firm desire to want a truthful history and to be open to both welcome and unwelcome findings and the settled disposition to value and support the institutions and social practices that engage in that search for truthful histories. In other words, it's that aspect of the citizen's integrity with respect to her own society's historical accountability. Where society owes its citizens a truthful account, for example, of difficult or deplorable historical events and practices that violated the dignity and rights of individuals, citizens show civic integrity in knowing that this, too, is a part of history and must be accepted and digested. Now, I'm speaking here of an individual virtue, an intelligently guided good habit of a citizen. I'm not speaking of a rigid rule of conduct or a demand for perfection. All virtues entail practical wisdom about the limits of the possible and about reasonable responses to conflicts of goods. Civic integrity involves an ingrained aspiration to truthfulness combined with an understanding of its complexity and of the social costs and conflicts that it might entail. And to head off a gross misunderstanding, I'm not suggesting that we devote ourselves to an Orwellian regime of, of state-sponsored truth. On the contrary, historical accountability involves an openness to evidence and to truths that are always being placed in new contexts by new information. So neither the public nor the state is a ministry of truth charged to tell us all what to believe. But neither, as John Stuart Mill so sunnily claimed, is truth somehow destined to emerge in a free-for-all of public speech. The fact is that some speech, the speech of those least powerful, is often socially inaudible, overwhelmed, or discredited. Indeed, the histories of oppression and discrimination of groups has always included, indeed required, forms of silencing, discounting, or discrediting what certain kinds of people 
claim about their experience, lest others would have to account to them. Speech in societies like ours is likely to have as much volume as it can pay for and faces a concentration of commercial media outlets with political agendas of their own. This is a kind of marketplace, but it is not the marketplace of ideas that Mill pictured in which we can be confident that truth will outcompete falsehood in the clash of opinion. What the citizen with civic integrity wants is to sustain multiple institutions and access for many voices willing to engage around some common standards of evidence in order to eliminate clear falsehoods and leave the space open for sustainable versions of the truth. Hence, the value of some established staples of liberal democratic order, freedom of speech and association, public and private universities with diverse research programs, strong primary and secondary public and private education to produce a literate citizenry, and free and competitive media with wide public access. I have not, though, found something distinctively like what I'm calling civic integrity in the list of civic virtue of the citizens of a liberal state and some very prominent writers on that topic. William Galston, for example, includes the disposition to engage in public discourse, contributing and listening as a political virtue of liberalism. Richard Dagger, my former colleague when I was at Arizona State, includes fair play and cherishing civic memory as civic virtues of his brand of Republican liberalism, not Republican with a capital R, <laughs> Republican in the Republican tradition. Um, one might find what I am calling civic integrity at the intersection of Dagger's fair play and civic memory, but it does not reduce to either one. Both of these authors, who are among the better known people writing who've written on civic virtue, include tolerance and a kind of public reasonableness among civic virtues. But civic integrity is not tolerance. It's not letting others have their own opinions or even respecting their exercise of autonomy in forming their own opinions. These do have their indispensable places. These are good things. Civic integrity requires, however, that one believe that it is important for society to move toward truthfulness and avoid myth, fable, unreality, or dishonesty. In liberal societies, meaning liberal democratic societies, this is tied to their deepest commitment to the dignity and equality of their citizens. Without the commitment to truth, some will have to live with lies and with disregard for their claims to justice as well as possibly with ridicule, hostility, or disrespect for them personally. And the public reasonableness of which liberal theorists like to speak, including John Rawls, must itself be held to a discipline of basic truthfulness, lest it become merely popular epistemic consensus. In other words, just you know what the most people find it compelling to believe. I believe that civic integrity and its aspect of the commitment to social truthfulness marks a distinctive ter territory and a fundamental social, personal, and interpersonal value. It's a harder virtue than tolerance or political reasonableness because it wills the truth where the truth may be profoundly unsettling to the understanding of one's society that may be bound up with aspects of one's own identity civic pride, and loyalties. Now, while he does not name civic integrity in my sense as a liberal civic virtue, William Galston does conclude his book, Liberal Purposes, with a brief discussion of the goods, as he calls them, latent in liberal practice. And one of the goods is openness to truth. Disappointingly, however, Galston argues that <laughs> civic education should aim at the support of the political community, not at truth. He advocates what he calls a rhetorical rather than rational pedagogy for civic education that will offer, I'm quoting, a nobler moralizing history 
rather than the revisionist accounts that historical research will, he says, almost certainly produce. <laughs> so he says that what, what's true is not really what civic education uh, sh uh, should be aiming at. He says it's unrealistic to expect more than a few citizens to move beyond the noble, moralized message. He is right to identify the tension between truthfulness and certain claims to society's nobility. But aside from his disappointing view of the many, and that's a literally ancient view, that goes back to Plato and I'm sure before, it is a surprising view that a society well worth preserving will have nothing good to say about itself once its worst deeds are exposed. A society that finds this is true is not in fact worth preserving, at least not as it stands, or more precisely, not as it has stood. Part of the virtue of civic integrity is grasping precisely this. If one believes one society is worthy, then one must believe that it can stand its own truths. So, conclusion. In one of his eloquent and moving books on historical memory and political forgiveness, Donald Shriver defends, quote, the, he calls it, the duty of citizens to pay attention to the unjust yet to be acknowledged historical suffering of some of their fellow citizens, end quote. I have placed the duty in question with the institutions of society as a whole and have instead suggested that it is a virtue of citizens to demand, support, and value an accurate history that allows them to live together in and with the truth. It's not something they can aspire to or achieve individually. It's rather a work of many and one that goes on over generations. But it affects the achievement of the basic respect and recognition that citizens do owe to each other. If one generation fails to demand and support historical accountability for the wrongs of the past, there is a good deal of evidence that the truth they refuse will not go away with time, but will only lie in waiting. And I could give you a long list of examples, a very interesting phenomenon that, especially in the last maybe half century uh, to a century, that uh, to an eerie degree, buried truths find their ways back out, find, find themselves emerging, even when people thought that no one would ever know that or ever cared. On a human time scale, the past, it seems, is not guaranteed to sink quickly without a trace, not even several generations down the line. I mean, think of native people in the Americas who still argue for the repossession of their land, for their political and cultural sovereignty, um, for claims, these as claims of justice that involve a history that goes back hundreds of years to European contact and hundreds of, or thousands of years before that. This is in part owing to the dedication of a few who continue to demand due attention to a history that is theirs, or to which they are heirs, but it's also because of how the past abides in the present. I don't mean only in street signs, place names, monuments, and mementos, but in ways we live, how we speak, in whom and what we believe, in the questions we ask and do not think to ask, in whom we recognize as part of our community, and whom we do not seem to care much about, and in the history we are willing to have taught. Civic integrity prepares us to remember differently when it is a matter of justice. Thank you. You'll take questions? Sure. You'll take questions. And you'll feel Sure. <laughs> it's only fair you listen to me. <laughs> I must hear you. Excellent. Professor Schultz? Thank you very much. Sorry, I just should. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was, it was wonderful. And, um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you could say some words about Right. 
Um, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, which many of you may have heard of, are a, a very uh, strikingly recent um, invention. <laughs> I mean, there have always been official inquiries into things, but Truth and Reconciliation Commissions are official projects in a short period, relatively short period of time, dedicated to exploring a particular episode or time period in which grave abuses, violence, or injustice have taken place, and to at least issue an authoritative report saying, you know, this is really what happened. Um, truth commissions have always tried to honor the victims who perished or the survivors who are victims or the survivors who lost people who are victims. But um, when South Africa had a truth commission in the 1990s, it gained worldwide fame because it was innovative in a number of ways. And one of the innovations was widespread public testimony of victims. So this brought together the principle of telling the true story, the actual events and the happenings, with the idea that important, crucial parts of the story had to come in the voice of the actual victims who would tell their own story. So these two things are related, but they're not the same, okay? Um, one way you can look at victims telling their stories is that they're providing evidence for the truthful history. And of course, that is one function of having victim testimonies in something like a truth commission is find out what happened. But there are some problematic aspects of that. One is that a victim of violence may speak truthfully but may not necessarily recall accurately everything that happened. So even the most impassioned or sincere testimony is not necessarily factually accurate, for example, in every respect. A victim might misremember aspects, misidentify participants. So like any other, if you treat this as evidence, like any other source of evidence, you have to combine sources of evidence to correct and rectify each other, okay? And certainly the testimony of victims, even where completely accurate, is only going to be able to say what happened to them or what they witnessed to happen to others, it won't explain why those things happened. It won't get at the structures of responsibility, command, policy that underlay atrocity or systemic injustice. So that's another limitation that victim testimony um, often has to be put together with lots of other sources of evidence to yield a story that in turn then will tell victims things that they do not know about what happened to them. I mean, they know what happened to them in the sense of what their experience was, but they may not know the causes, the patterns, the responsibilities, the powers behind it. However, there's an independent reason to hear the victims other than the idea that they're a part of the evidence, okay? And, um, and that is because, as, it, as shown in the South African practice, and now this has been adopted by truth commissions in many other places, is the idea that we're used to the idea that, especially when the victims don't survive, that they don't get to speak. And we're used to the idea that even when the victims do survive, they tend to be people who are out of power or less powerful, and so often they still don't get to speak. So the act of inviting victims to speak is an act of affirming the right they have to speak, that their voice is as good as or important as anyone else's voice, that even if they were members of groups that were uh, persecuted or oppressed or excluded, that now they get the stage, as it were, they get the attention. And so that's a, a, both a real and symbolic process of honoring them. Honoring them not because of some great accomplishment, except that they maybe survived something terrible, but honoring them as full and equal 
fellow citizens, and full and equal human beings alongside others. So I think there's the sort of evidentiary function um, where you really need to hear what people experienced and what they saw. But then there's also the moral and political function of affirming the dignity of the very people whose dignity was denied, um, the very people whose value was um, degraded or dismissed by those who abused them, uh, violated their rights, uh, did whatever was convenient to do with them with no regard for their human dignity. Did you have something else in mind about? Well, um, I, 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 no, I think that, that actually I would agree with you, and, um, but I, I suppose I would um, wonder if, if you would be so bold as to say that even Oh, yes, yes. Um, right, right. Um, although that, that um, the accountability part is a two-way thing. So it means that um, victims are entitled to assume their proper place in calling for accountability of society and others in virtue of what happened to them. And that in turn means what happens still very little. <laughs> Now that we hear from victims is we don't hear much from the people actually responsible for the violence being accountable to both their direct victims and to society more generally. And in this regard, South Africa was again quite unique because of its setup which traded the testimony of perpetrators of human rights abuses for individual amnesty if they testified to the facts. And that policy was very controversial, and that policy has not ever been repeated in another Truth Commission because of the controversial status of amnesty. But it did actually get something that is pretty unique, even if on a small scale, which is getting the people who actually committed terrible violations, who murdered, who tortured, who you know, kidnapped and illegally detained people, who disappeared people, um, getting them to say, for the record, and often in South Africa, a significant percentage, on TV and radio, I did that. I tortured that person. This is how I did it. This is where we, this is what, where we burned the bodies. This is what we did. So that, that kind of jump starts a practice of accountability that had been lacking, but in an incomplete. Uh, kind of way. I would also say um, that, that victim testimony is crucial to teaching us all what human rights really mean by showing in real human terms what are the horrifying things that are done that we have reason to call abuses of human rights. You know, that language can become very formal and legalistic, but the victim's testimony says, this is what it means. Um, you know, your daughter can be disappeared and the child she was carrying can be handed off to somebody and you never see the child again. I'm talking about, say, the situation in Argentina, which is now being revisited. So that's another really, really important Role. But I guess I want to distinguish the roles in which victims are contributing to a social good, like providing evidence, giving deeper meaning and, and concreteness to human rights language, and the part that actually honors the victims themselves, um, affirms their dignity, regardless of what contribution it makes to any other larger agenda. Bill? Again, Margaret, thank you. Uh, that was terrific. You, you spoke about um, other liberal theorists, or liberal theorists, who address the virtues of um, liberal citizenship. And, and you know, I think, rightly, that tolerance and public reasonableness don't reach to what you're commending here, civic integrity. Um, 
I, it's, it is a good point, and I'm, I'm thinking, but I'm not able to kind of pull it back up fully, of um, some places uh, in particular, something I was looking at in connection with some other work of, of Walser talking about the need for the, the sort of the shared narrative. Right. Um, and, and I do think that you're right, that it'd be interesting to go back and look at right. the things Walser says about the sort of in, the internal kind of criticism, you know, a la McIntyre also, right. the idea that a tradition contains its own um, inherent um, momentum of, of critique right. uh, and response. Um, and I think you're, you're right, though, to suggest that at least without looking at it closely, I tend to think that maybe Walser and Galston might have something in common about the idea that it might be of of most importance right. to have the binding the narrative. The I think that's um, right. yeah. Although Walzer would explain it in a more communitarian vein and, and Galston would explain it in a more kind of liberal individualist vein. And what I'm uncomfortable with is when a certain kind of um, uh, pleasing or rewarding civic identity is the objective <laughs> when that is actually uh, incompatible mm -hmm. with being open to certain truths. And, and I actually think this is kind of, you know, it's sort of surprising what Golston says about this, because it's a very old story. You know, we need the noble lie. Um, and we can't expect, you know, you can't expect most people to get all that, rea all that, that truth and reality. You know, they need the noble lie. Which seems to me, you know, a dismal. At least the people like Plato, they weren't they weren't arguing for a democrat, a liberal democratic social order when they said that. But it seems pretty depressing to me that people who would be would go that route. So I just thought it was interesting when I went to check, and I'm not an expert on this. I'll have to look more into it. But I went and sampled some of the very well known fare on civic virtues in liberal societies, and I thought, you know, this isn't actually one that people talk about. And, and yet, what, what I tried to stress is, in a way, it, it's, it's a suitably liberal virtue, because I'm just I'm, I'm saying that this doesn't promise a closure on one story. What the demand is that any stories we take seriously and dispute about and consider candidates for our history are answerable to truth in some fairly straightforward senses. Uh, based on evidence that people can recognize as, as important. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm actually just wondering if you want to push your claims about the relationship between civic integrity and uh, virtues such as tolerance a little further. Um, I think I'd be inclined to say that uh, you can't really have tolerance if you don't have the kind of openness to and search for uh, truth that you were talking about. So what you end up getting uh, with some of these characters is a little bit too much of a simulacra of, of tolerance or something. And if you don't really know what people have actually been up to, um, then it begins to seem a little bit odd to me to claim that you're genuinely being liberal about sort of respecting uh, what people do with their conscious choices, for instance. Um. I, I, it's certainly true that there is a kind of, you might say, sort of, you know, cheap and lazy tolerance, which is sort of like, whatever. <laughs> um, but um, I, I guess the part I'm not seeing, so maybe I need to ask you to re-put this if I'm not seeing it, is you seem to be saying that there's a stronger connection between what I'm calling civic integrity and tolerance. And I'm not sure that I see that. Um, defenses of tolerance usually, it seems to me, appeal on the one hand to um, one of the prime virtues of liberal societies, which is just coexistence and the mediation of conflict through political rather than violent means. 
So that just means that you have to, you know, create a wide space for people not to be um, interfering in ways that create more conflict. So on the one hand, you know, social peacefulness and stability, and on the other, autonomy. The idea that part of respecting persons in the way that liberal individualist societies exist to respect them is to respect them as individuals with the capability to make their own decisions, form their own beliefs, and you know, um, within and to, to open up a very wide space for them to do that. But I'm not seeing then the connection. I do see the potential conflict because this means, and I do think that this is a problem for liberal societies, and I've come to thinking about this through thinking about the need for official truth tellings, um, that there are some pretty big stakes in having certain truths established and kept um, vivid and central. And so this has resulted in otherwise Dem, you know, liberal democratic societies like Germany and France and Canada in, for example, laws that Americans would find unacceptable on grounds of free speech. Laws that forbid denying the Holocaust. Or in France, I think it's atroci any, any, you know, established atrocities. Um, and I see that as a real, as a genuine conflict. I see that as a hard nut. Um, meaning that I see what those societies are doing and the seriousness with which, with which they're saying, you know, there are, there are some things that we really cannot afford to let people make free with. So we're going to draw a line there um, on the one hand, and then the, the idea that's much more familiar to people in the U.S. that that somehow in itself is illiberal, is repressive. Shouldn't people be free to have their own opinions, even obnoxious, crazy opinions, like being neo-Nazis or denying the Holocaust or something like that? So I, I, think there's a, I think there's a real stake there. And this is where I see a conflict rather than a, a kind of somehow connection between tolerance and civic integrity. It seems to me that civic integrity's commitment to truthfulness will have to mark some borders, um, not necessarily in terms of criminalizing certain speech, but rather in the affirmative, uh, for example, like protecting the fact that um, truthful histories based on good evidence are taught in public schools and not just whatever is popular with the people who have the loudest voices at the parent-teacher meeting or on the school board. Yeah, I can see how, um, I mean, I don't Oh, okay, but see, but let me ask you this. It, the reason tolerance has, has been such a central liberal virtue is because of the histories, in fact, that led to seeing, for example, that religious toleration was the only way to avoid, you know, hundreds of years of bloody, endless wars, for example, over religious faith. But, right, sorry. But, and I think citizens ought to know that. <laughs> well, exactly. And so yeah. what I'm saying is uh, having that kind of integrity about keeping the truth before people's eyes, I think, can lead to a more challenging form of tolerance. I think sometimes the inclination is to kind of let certain difficult things slide a little bit and to sort of, sort of imply, uh, well, you know, if we forgot things a little bit that made it easier for us to all get along, yeah. uh, that would be OK. That, I mean, it would be kind of mean and nasty to keep reminding, you know, people at Villanova about how Protestants used to be, you know, so anti-Catholic. 
um, doesn't that just make things more difficult? Why yeah. isn't that unnecessary? Yeah, and there are both flippant and also much more serious versions of that idea that, um, you know, it can be argued that certain forms of forgetting are essential to peaceful coexistence. Um, I don't believe that because I think the truth comes back. Um, so I, I think it, it, there has to be some other solution. But that is a, that is a real problem. I, I do think this, though, and I'll just finish on, on this note, that I, I, I tried to set it up. It's maybe not as explicit as it could be that the truths in question to which civic integrity is responsive are truths that are needed because without them, citizens cannot really be in proper relations of mutual recognition and respect. And that means that there could be past injustices that really don't matter too much. I mean, it'd still be good to know them, but I think my argument in that way is a little self-limiting. But it turns out that usually, you know, um, find any form of systemic social disadvantage in a society and dig there because you will find histories that that society probably has buried or occluded or turned into shadows in a fable or something like that. Yeah, Barbara. I, I was just going to say that it, it seems like at some level that tolerance might be necessary as an attitude with which one deals with the world in order to even hear the truth mm. or to pursue the truth. That's a really good point. I like that. I'm going to take that point and credit you with that. Um, no, that's really good because if anything, I think I would see it more that way, that, that tolerance could enable civic integrity. Because as I pointed out, it's a hard, I'm saying civic, integ civic integrity of the type I'm talking about is hard because you have to tolerate. You have to hear the claims and the history behind the claims of people where that can be very deeply painful, angering, hurtful, repudiating things you know, love, and believe, thought you knew, and loved, and believed in, and so on. So that's a really good, a good point. And on that really good point, um, I think we'll call this session to, to a close. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you.